Lord and good morning everybody. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this day? If you are glad shout out a hallelujah. All right, we have a certificate of baptism to be given to Preetham. So we welcome him, Preetham. Um, it says beautifully here, let it be known to all that Preetham has been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, baptized on the 15th day of December, 2023, at Amazing Grace Church, Dubai. And it also says a beautiful scripture, and it says in Galatians 3.27, all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Amen. So congratulations. Amen. Pritham comes from a different background, religious background, but he's accepted the Lord, went through the waters of baptism, and the Lord is accomplishing his work through his life. God bless you. Amen. Well, we have more baptisms uh, uh, candidates ready. So if you are ready and um, you can let us know about your uh, consent and so we can get the pool um, ready for you, uh, get the um, permission, and then one day we can have the baptism service uh, take place and you can partake of that and be blessed. All right? Okay. Well, that's a time that we will get into the Word of God. So I want your full attention because the Lord loves you dearly. And He says when you come to hear the Word of God, you must always draw closer to hear the Word of God. Right? When you make a vow, right? You come closer. Listen carefully to the word that you speak and the vows that you make so that the vows that you take, you'll be careful to perform in the house of God. Well, we are in the part five of master class with the master planner. And uh, we are going to look into that word. You know, I was, I'm always enamored with the preaching of the gospel. Because ever since the Lord saved my life, there has never been an occasion that I have not preached. Let me tell you that. There's never been an occasion that I have not shared my faith with somebody. Whether it's a guy who fills your tank in the tank station, in the petrol station, whether it's a guy who comes to clean your house, or whether it's somebody, or a gardener or whatever. It doesn't matter who is there. I've always made a point to share the gospel with the people to an extent that I've also gone to certain places, religious places, and I have shared with those men and women of those religious houses, the word of God. So what I'm trying to tell you is ever since the Lord put his hand upon my life, I never refrained even a moment to share the gospel of Jesus with anyone and everyone who needs it. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's what enchants me. That's what enamors me. That's what, you know, excites me every time when an opportunity is given to share the gospel. I'll go to any length to do, even if it is a one soul or two people, I'm willing to share the gospel. Hallelujah. And so it is very important for us to understand. And I like what, you know, John MacArthur said, and he said, quotes, you are the only Bible some unbelievers will ever read and your life is under scrutiny every day. What do others learn from you? Do they see an accurate picture of God in you? And that's interesting. It's a good question. Do they actually see the accurate picture of God in you? If they don't see the accurate picture of God in you, then either they are confused or they don't want to follow your God because your life and your lifestyle does not reflect or emit the glory of God the way God intends. And so it is imperative that we understand that, right? Hudson Taylor said, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supplies. Hallelujah. I also like what Rick Warren said. He said, the way you store treasure in heaven is by investing in getting people there. That's the biggest treasure. Hallelujah. The biggest treasure is 
that you invest in heaven is getting other people into heaven. You are going to heaven, praise God. And that's a good thing. We all rejoice as going to heaven. We dance, we sing, we praise God, we say hallelujahs. Right? And that's a good thing. Yes, to come and celebrate Jesus and worship Jesus is the first thing that as believers we learn to do so. And then the second thing is that we learn to minister to one another. First is minister unto the Lord and then minister unto one another. And today we are going to focus on how to minister to the world. Hallelujah. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. To be a soul winner is the happiest thing in this world. And with every soul you bring to Jesus Christ, you seem to get a new heaven here upon the earth. This morning I posted on my Facebook a beautiful quote from John Wesley. And he said, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen. They alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And no wonder John Wesley did a fantabulous work in his era. Hundreds and thousands of churches. The Methodist denomination came out of him. Because he was passionate, give me hundred men who fear God. Give me hundred men who are full of the Holy Ghost. Give me hundred men who desire nothing but God. Hallelujah. I like what Billy Graham said. The greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking out the lost and the helpless. That's the work of the church. My dear brothers and sisters, is not to keep reaching the reached, but keep reaching the unreached. Because the gospel has come to us and we are glad to be trained. We are glad to be in the house of the Lord. We are glad to celebrate the goodness of God. We are glad to draw out the waters of salvation and keep drinking of it. But let me tell you that one thing that the Lord has called us is to go out and our feet that are blessed feet, our feet that spreads the good news of Jesus is the feet is called the blessed feet of men. I also like what Hudson Taylor said, you must go forward on your knees. I know there are certain temples in India where people pay homage by walking on the knees to go to the temple. They drag themselves on the knees because they want to pay a penance. They want to show their consecration, their devotion to that deity. They are willing to walk on the knees. But I like what Hudson Taylor said, you must go forward on your knees. Hallelujah. And that is why we as Amazing Grace Church, we take out 40 days of a year and we dedicate into fasting and praying and we dedicate ourselves to show to the deity of deities, to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that we are committed to the cause of Christ. It is not about us. It is not about that we brag about of fasting and praying. It is about the souls that are perishing. It is about the needs that are to be met. It is about the world that is living in darkness. <laughs> I also like what Billy Graham said. If we had more hell in the pulpit, we would have less hell in the pew. <laughs> People are scared of preaching hell from the pulpit. Because they said they'll scare the congregation. But no sir, we don't get scared by the teaching and the preaching of hell. Because when you have the knowledge of hell, you'll desire heaven more than anything else. If you'll understand that what happens, that how you'll be barbecued for life in hell, then you will always be willing to go to the living waters and say, God, give me your living waters and give me the waters of salvation and let me be saved and let me be healed and let me be delivered and let me be redeemed in the mighty name of Jesus. I'll walk after you, Lord, not after this world, not after the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, but Lord, I want to see you in all your glory and I want to be in that place that belongs to you, that you reign supreme. That you live there. I want to live with you. Hallelujah. If we had more hell in the pulpit, we would have less hell in the pew. 
I was talking to my son Judah. Dad, you preach it, man. You preach it. <laughs> to my older one. I was talking to him. He said, Dad, what are you preaching? I said, I'm preaching ministry to the world. And I quoted to him. Then you know, what son Billy Graham said, if he had more hell in the pulpit, we would have less hell in the pew. And no wonder that man who was the world greatest evangelist saved millions of people for the Lord because he was never afraid to preach the full gospel. And God gave him a harvest. And my dear brothers and sisters, we are called to do so. And therefore, certain men have said evangelism is not a professional job for a few trained men, but is instead the unrelenting responsibility of every person who belongs to the company of Jesus. Hallelujah. Unrelenting responsibility of every person who belongs to Yeshua the Messiah who says I'm a friend of Jesus. He who says I'm a disciple of Jesus. He who says I love Jesus. It is your passion. It is your primary purpose is to take the gospel to somebody who's dying. Hallelujah. Another man of God said, David Jeremiah said, the only way the corporate body of Christ will fulfill the mission that Christ has given it is for individual Christians to have a vision for fulfilling that mission personally. Don't give it to somebody else. It's your mission. It's your primary call that you will preach the gospel to the nations if you are saved, if you are born again, if you are water baptized, if you are spirit filled, you just don't keep talking in tongues at home. You are operational in the realm of the spirit to save a soul that is perishing and languishing without the knowledge of Yeshua. And something I wrote last, year, last week, the great commission is directly proportional to the obedience of the great commandment is directly proportional when you want to do the great commission it cannot take place without you understanding the great commandment and the bible says in the book of matthew chapter 22 verses 36 to 40 that guy came to teach uh, to jesus and he said teacher which is the greatest commandment in the law and jesus said to him you shall love the lord your god with all your heart with all your mind with all your soul and this is the first and great commandment these are the words of jesus this is the first and great commandment and the second is like it what is the second commandment the first is ministry to the Lord. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I honor you, Jesus. That is every day of your life. Not once, not twice. Every day, every moment, every breath. You are a worshiper of Yeshua. You are a magnifier of the name of Yeshua. Wherever you are, you are made to glorify Jesus. And my dear brothers and sisters... Jesus is saying, this is the first and the great commandment, yes, but we need to progress. Amen. That's the primary commandment, the first and the great, but the second commandment is equally important. And Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments. The first and the second commandment on these two hang all the law. The entire Old Testament along with the major and the minor prophets. It hangs on that pivot. And so my dear brothers and sisters, ministry to the world is imperative, is inbred, as ingrained one, the moment you're baptized in the Spirit of God, you are actually impacted to create an impact in your environment. Hallelujah. You're not impacted so that you will have some goosebumps of the Holy Ghost. You're not impacted that you'll have some hula baloos in the Holy Ghost or you'll have some chill feeling and some heart feeling. No. The Holy Ghost is beyond the feelings and he's beyond the goosebumps. He brings you to a place that you will be still and know that I am your God. I will be exalted in your midst. 
after all your goosebumps and all your feelings and all your shiverings and quakings and quiverings he brings you to the stillness of his spirit where he can lay you down and he can sit you down and he can speak a word to your spirit and reveal his glory to you reveal his power to you reveal his inner being to you that's what he used to do in the garden of eden with adam and eve every evening god would come down and do what commune with them and reveal and talk to them and sup with them probably had a great time in the fellowship with adam and eve so my dear brothers and sisters ministry to the world happens the moment you start saying i love you jesus he said okay the second commandment is equally important love your neighbor as yourself who's your neighbor the person who's sitting next to you not in the church amen you are about to see your neighbor on the left or the right in the church all the people are saved hopefully if you're not then today is the day of salvation if not then today you give your life to Jesus if you're watching us live give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be in the company of believers repent of your sin take a turn around of 180 degree not this 360 degree I've seen some believers that they keep going round and round the circle no 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 180 degree is the angle required of turning around right so that you can follow Christ if you're following the world you'll follow Jesus and we sing the beautiful song I have decided to follow Jesus don't we sing that song I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back right no turning back so we are called to worship Jesus we are called to minister to Jesus and then we are called to minister to one another that is your in reach and then after that comes the outreach is ministry to the world so when we start studying about the ministry of the world and getting equipped how to minister to the world let's see a few things that I want to just lay before you so that you can comprehend it correctly all right so everyone will need to understand number one is the plan say the plan all right what will be done number two is the purpose why it will be done number three the procedure right how it will be done number four the people who will do it number five the place where will it be done and number six is the program when will it be done keep those points in your mind and keep it importantly for everyone as believers of the church we must understand this plan the purpose the procedure the people the place and the program why it is so important for us to know is because Jesus told his disciples that at the end of the end time days perilous times are going to come into this world and Jesus was saying that the world would face a time of great distress and difficulty it's not easy to live in this world nowadays one man of God said the life is war and you must understand how to battle correctly life is not hunky-dory all the time for everybody know from the time you took birth you came out crying you were you know playing football in your mother's cervix right you're knocking at the cervix to open up that's why your coconut is strongest bone in your body your skull is the strongest bone in your body do you know that yeah. not your thigh bone or your leg bone or your shin bone your coconut is very strong because you are playing football in your mother's womb and with that football knocks you opened up the cervix you came out into this world and how did you came out smiling have you seen a smiling baby come out I produced two sons before my eyes the other one the younger one I cut his umbilical cord then none of them smiled at my face they were crying when you come in this world you cry 
There is pain, there is sorrow, there is suffering, there is disease, there is sin, there is sickness. It's not easy. You may be happy that the mother has delivered a baby, but the baby has to has a good, great journey ahead. It's not easy. Who said life was easy? Life is a war. And you need to learn the art of war to overcome and to understand that how you will succeed in this life in the name of Jesus. And the faster you get hold of Jesus and the faster you make Jesus your personal savior, I promise you, you will be in a winning team. It doesn't matter what the war is. It doesn't matter who the warrior is. The warrior within you is the power of the Holy Spirit. As Alin was saying, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It is greater power of the Spirit of God that is inside of you than any power of the world outside. No demon of hell and no power of man can ever thwart the powerful warrior that's inside of you and he teaches you the art of war. Tell your neighbor art of war. Hallelujah. So Jesus was telling his disciples that the world will face a great time of distress and difficulty. Fear, hatred, greed would cause the nations of the earth to war against each other. And the last days will be dark days indeed. These are the words of Jesus. If you would study in the book of Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21, he talks about the end time days. He talks how the gory days will be there, how bloody days will be there, how painful days will be there. Dark days are coming ahead. Who said glorious days are coming? But there is hope for the church. That is why the Lord gave me that word, the dawn of hope. For the year, rise, renew, reach. Rise, renew, reach. That's why the Isaiah was prophesying for the church. And he was saying, arise for the light has come. In Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1. And in Isaiah chapter 60 verse 2, he says, For the darkness shall cover the earth. Hallelujah. What did he prophesy? Darkness shall cover the earth. What is going to cover the earth? Darkness. Tell your neighbor, darkness is going to cover the earth. This is prophesied by Isaiah. Hallelujah. And deep darkness, the peoples, the people of the world and nations will be under deep darkness. But, I like the but. Hallelujah. What is going to happen? Come on everybody, read it along. But the Lord shall rise upon you and his glory shall be seen upon you. The greater the darkness, the greater the glory. Come on. I don't care what the darkness is. I do care for the glory. Because if I am walking in the glory and I'm enamored with the glory and I'm empowered with the glory and I have the Shekinah in me and upon my life, I promise you, no matter what the darkness be all around me, it must flee in Jesus' name. Because you are the glory house. You are the power house. You are the lighthouse. And where the lighthouse is, it gives, it causes darkness to flee in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Darkness must flee in the name of the Lord. Disease must flee in the name of the Lord. Discouragement must flee in the name of the Lord. Distress must flee in the name of the Lord. Demons must flee in the name of the Lord God Almighty because the light of his glory has shone upon you and his glory shall be seen upon you. It will be evident. Your faces will be glorious. Your faces will be shining. No matter what the difficult situation and no matter what the difficult time you may be going through. But let me tell you, irrespective of that difficult situation, you will still be glorifying the Lord. Uh, and you will be still be praising the Lord uh, and be saying, no matter what happens, uh, I am more than conqueror in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I am more than victorious uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I have overcome. Because of Jesus. Hallelujah. My dear brothers and sisters, this is the bright hope for the Christian church that the Lord has given. When the darkness increases, the glory of the Lord also increases upon his people. And the scriptures state that categorically that in the last days I will pour my Holy Spirit upon all flesh. 
every flesh that believes every flesh that believes God is saying I will pour my Holy Spirit upon all flesh and all the flesh that is present in the presence of God say hallelujah God is going to pour his spirit he's pouring his power upon you upon your sons and your daughters and the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2 17 to 18 and verse 21 in the last days it shall be says God that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh who's saying God is saying whose spirit will he pour his own spirit the Holy Spirit is going to pour upon each and every one of you. And then he says that your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will do what? They shall prophesy. Hallelujah. Who are going to prophesy? Your sons, your daughters. You will prophesy. You will dream. Old people will dream dreams. Young men will have visions. Children will prophesy. Come on. We are in a company of prophets. Why? Because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the power of God. And the glory of God is upon us. That no matter what the darkness is. The glory that is inside of us. Will defeat the darkness. Will eliminate the darkness. Will cause the darkness to flee. In Jesus name. Because my glory. I will cause to rise upon you. It doesn't matter. That how. Turbulent. Was your raising up days growing up days it doesn't matter what your background was it doesn't matter how you were raised up but it does matter that when the glory of God hits you when he comes upon you when he comes to live inside of you your perspective and your environment changes for good Amen. Amen. hallelujah I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Say prophesy. What are you going to prophesy? What are you going to prophesy? You'll prophesy the word over your life. You'll prophesy the covenantal promises over your life. Lord, your word says so that by your stripes I'm healed. Your word says so that I'm prosperous. Your word says so that I'm protected. Your word says so, Lord, that my future is blessed. That my children are blessed after me. The work of my hands are blessed. My business will thrive and flourish and prosper. Your word says that I will be the head and not the tail. I will always be above and never beneath. In the name of Jesus, oh Lord, I am empowered by your spirit. And I will speak the word and I'll speak the promise. And that's a prophecy. That's how you prophesy. You get that word and you speak that word because he says, I stand behind my word to make it happen in Jeremiah 1.12. You get that word and you speak that word. That's a prophecy in the New Testament. I will pour my Holy Spirit upon all flesh. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will create that hunger and that thirst in your spirit to go back into the word of God and you'll become a student of the word of God. No one has to tell you, have you read the Bible, son? Yes, it's our responsibility as parents to encourage your children to read the Holy Word. It's our responsibility to encourage them to, you know, pray every day. We inculcate those habits and those are great habits and good habits. Because we are called to do so with our little ones. We are commanded to do so, rather. We are instructed to instruct our children so that when they are old, they will never depart from the Lord. Train them. Hallelujah. Training is given to your children when they're growing up. So when they're grown up, they will not depart from God. They will be in the house of God. They will be serving God. They will be worshipping God. They will be in turn leading their wives and children in the ways of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. So my dear brothers and sisters. God always brings a warning and a witness before times of great judgment. And grace spurned brings judgment. 
This is what I was writing. A caution and a testimony precedes significant moments of divine judgment. Rejecting grace results in facing judgment. When grace abounds over our life, we must with both hands grab it, receive it and don't let it go. When Jesus passes by, say, Lord, pass me not, my gentle Savior. Lord, stand by me and bless me in the name of the Lord. Lord, deliver me. And Father, I want to follow you. I want to be enamored with you. And I want to be empowered by you so that I will walk after you. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, 6, Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will war against them with the sword of my mouth. It's interesting to note that John the Baptist started his ministry with repentance. Jesus' theme of ministry and preaching of the gospel was repentance. And the closing remarks in the, uh, uh, by the apostle John is also repentance. Where Jesus says, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will war against them with the sword of my mouth. Hallelujah. And for this reason... For what reason? That the judgment is coming upon the earth from God upon the wickedness of man, upon the sin of humanity. What must the church do? Is a good question for us to ask. We need to become a lighthouse. We need to become powerhouses. We need to become glory houses. So that when we are out in the world, in the marketplace ministry, there'll be signs, wonders, miracles at your workplace. You know why? Because at your workplace, God will pour his spirit through you into those vessels, those who are willing to receive the grace. For this reason, God desires to unify the church in her worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What does God want you to do? Unitedly worship God. Hallelujah. Unitedly work for God. Unitedly warfare with God. And unitedly be a witness for God. Hallelujah. I said four words with W's. Unitedly worship God. Unitedly work for God and with God. And unitedly Wage a spiritual warfare and unitedly witness for God. The power of the preaching of the gospel is not given to the angels. He could have done it. He could have told, hey guys, you know, these human beings are, you know, delinquent. No matter how much love I've shown to them, they still keep going back into their worldly ways. They still don't do my work of the witnessing. They still don't do. They act like delinquent children. No, 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 no. He could have said that. Not, but the precious gift of the preaching of the gospel, he did not give it to the angels. He gave it to the sons and daughters. Hallelujah. He gave it to you and me, the sons and daughters of the most high God. Because he did not want to bestow the precious gospel to anyone else but to his children. And you and I are the children of the most high God. And my dear brothers and sisters, revival will come only if Christ's power and glory are revealed through his church throughout the world. Then only revival will come. That's why Jesus is praying one beautiful prayer. In the book of John chapter 17 verses 20 to 21. I do not pray for these alone. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. Through whose words? Through the word of the disciples. They will be preacher men. Come on. You and I will be preacher men and women. Ever since we were saved. Ever since we were water baptized. Born again. Spirit filled. God has given us the gift of salvation. And the gift of preaching the gospel. Which he has not given to his angels. He's given to you and me. And he's praying. I do not pray for these alone. That is his disciples. But also for those who will believe in me. Through their word. That they may all be what? One. One mind, one accord, one worship, one work, one warfare, one witness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you with me church? 
So what is Jesus praying? That they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. May they also be one in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. Your unity is a threat to the devil. Your unity is a threat to demonic hosts and powers of Satan outside because your unity declares the magnanimity of his power in this dark world. That's what he does. Hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 24 verse 14, Jesus is saying, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. My dear brothers and sisters, the end will not come till we are willing and till we are ready to do what the Lord has called us to do. And what is the purpose of God? God wants the world to be reconciled to him. Say reconciliation. reconciliation. God's plan and our mission. Come on. Yeah, that's what it is. Reconciliation is God's plan and God's plan is our mission. That's what he wants to do. And what does the word reconciliation mean? It's a beautiful word. It means to bring together people in peace whose relationships are broken. Right? Right? God so much loves humanity because our relationship was broken with God the Father. He loved us so dearly that the Bible records in John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He loved us so much. My dear brothers and sisters, God's love is beyond your wildest imagination or beyond your comprehension. It is only by the revelation of his spirit that you can be able to understand the love of God. Otherwise, it's not possible. In the Bible, it says, and Apostle Paul writes the same note, and he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, he says, all this is from God who has reconciled us to himself, through whom? Through Jesus Christ, and has given to us, what? The ministry of reconciliation. To everybody, Paul is saying to the church, the royal priesthood of God, 1 Peter 2 9 the called out ones the chosen ones the peculiar people of God who are called out of darkness into the eternal light they have been given a ministry and that ministry is a ministry of reconciliation that's what he's given that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting the sins against them and has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation Hallelujah. He's not entrusted to the angels or to the archangels or to the seraphims or to the cherubims. No, 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 no. There are huge entities in the heavenly realms, but he did not choose them. He chose you and me to give the ministry of reconciliation. How fortunate and how blessed children of God we are. Hallelujah. So we are ambassadors for Christ. What are we? Tell your neighbor. We are ambassadors for Christ. Hallelujah. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Do you have family members who are not saved? Do you have spouses, children who are not saved? Those who have people who are not yet saved in your vicinity, in your marketplace, and you're crying out to the Lord, Lord, give me that soul, give me that family, give me that friend. Are you burdened in your spirit? If you're burdened in your spirit, God will enable you to do something very powerful and God will empower you so that you'll be able to preach the gospel to the nations in the name of Jesus because the world is languishing in darkness. They have not yet seen the light. They only can see the light that is inside of you and that light must burn brightly. Every day and every moment 
of your life that increase of light must happen and the more you'll be an intimate relationship with God the Father the more the powerful light will emanate through you and that's what happened with Moses when for 40 days and 40 nights he was in the company of God when he came down after 40 days my dear brothers and sisters the people of the world could not behold uh, the countenance of Moses's face why because Moses's face was shining brighter than the sun they couldn't look at him because the people couldn't look he had to put a veil how much more how much more will be the power of the glory that is in you will be greater than what glory Moses had in the Old Testament the Bible records that greater glory greater power greater light greater illumination that great glory and that great power is available to you by the power of the Holy Spirit living right inside of you in Jesus name Hallelujah. if you're not yet filled with the Holy Spirit say Lord fill me with the Holy Spirit I need your power I need your glory I need your light to Lord Jesus I need you to empower me O oh Lord I don't want anyone to baptize me I want you to baptize me in the Holy Ghost that's why the Bible says men can baptize you in water but it is me who baptizes you in the Holy Ghost yes. hallelujah that baptism is of a different level at a different degree and that degree is a powerful presence of God that he inundates you with. My dear brothers and sisters, if you see in the book of Acts and you start studying from the book of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the church is having an exuberant time. The church has grown from 3,000 to 5,000, from 5,000 to 8,000. Just around chapter 8, and in that period of time, the church was very excited and very comfortable and they were happy reaching the reach. They were happy because the Lord was adding them souls every day because every day they were having life groups. Every day they were having house church. Every day they were not playing badminton and a badminton court. I'm not against that because I myself play badminton and I enjoy playing badminton and I enjoy playing cricket and I enjoy playing every other game. I'm a jack of all, master of none. I love sports but they were not playing sports they were at the feet of the apostles every day they were not having live group once a day oh pastor praise the Lord what a lovely time we had oh praise the Lord pastor what a lovely meal we had great testimony yes praise the Lord for that but they were meeting every day and the Lord added to them souls and the church grew to 8,000 people 8,000 people they have no synagogue, they have no temple, they had no auditorium that could accommodate 8,000 people. So they met house to house. Every church was a lighthouse. Every church was a house of prayer. Every house was a church. So they were men of mission. All the men of the church said amen. They were men of mission. They, had the, they knew the plan of God is reconciliation. They made the plan of God their mission so that they will go and reach the unreached. And the book of Acts is the story of men with a mission to reach the world for Christ. And in the early chapters we find they were chosen, they were called, they were prepared for the task and they were sent. A going church is a growing church. Good morning. I said something a going church is a growing church a giving church is a growing church so what did God do Lord gave them time to be trained to grow in the fruit of the spirit and excel in the spiritual gifts the growing time involved ministry to the Lord and ministry to one another remember this every believer is a priest amen we know that every believer is a priest but what were they were doing under the apostles? They were being trained by the apostles. To do what? How to minister to the Lord and how to minister to one another. Out of the ministry to the Lord and ministry to the one another. Emerged the ministry to the world. Because that's where they got trained. That's where they knew how to heal the sick. That's where they knew how to cast out the demons. They had life training under the hands of the apostles. 
house to house. They were breaking bread and learning the word. And they were praying and they were fellowshipping. And we find in Acts chapter 7, Stephen was the first Christian who became a martyr. You know the Stephen? It's not pronounced step hen. It's Stephen. Right? Some people say step hen when they're reading the Bible. It's called Stephen. In chapter 7, and Stephen, the Bible records, was the first missionary movement that the church, Christian church, began. The first martyrdom took place because he was willing to preach the gospel, the undiluted word of the Lord, and he started to reveal what he could see. His revelation that he sees Christ on the right hand of God the Father caused a stony death. He was stoned to death because of his revelation. My dear brothers and sisters, the more the revelation, remember you should know how to reveal the revelation in God's appointed time and in God's appointed place. Even though it can cause martyrdom, but yes, that was the first martyrdom and there was the first man, Stephen, who preached the gospel and he died. You progress to chapter 8, you find Saul, the persecutor. These are men. Men, a man Stephen who was waiting on tables, he was not the apostle, he was not the pastor, he was not the prophet, he was not the teacher, he was not the evangelist, he was waiting on the tables, he was giving chai at the end. And he was willing to die for Jesus. Because he was so empowered, enamored with the love of God, that he could not dilute the message of the cross. And he would say, it is you who killed Jesus on the cross of Calvary. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, 3 and 4, it says, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. The church was growing in Jerusalem. Hallelujah, we like Jerusalem. Church grew in Jerusalem, 8,000 people in chapter 8. Alright, so what is happening? When the church was thriving, growing, progressing, flourishing, prospering, Became multiplied levels of people. Thousands of them come together. Right? What is happening? They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Except the apostles. Now see what's happened. Apostles remain in Jerusalem. But all the congregation of 8,000 people. Who were under the leadership of the apostles. Are all scattered. Come on. Say scattered. When you become too comfortable, God will bring persecution and he will chase you with fire on your bottom so that you'll do what the Lord wants you to do. That's right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what God does. This church was so comfortable, they had the apostolic covering, they had the powerful church, the infant stages of the church grew rapidly. But now, they were all scattered, the Bible records. Except the apostles. But what was Saul doing? Saul ravaged the church, entering house by house. Come on, every house church, shout out a hallelujah. Sometimes a soul is sent to your house. House to house. And what's happening? He ravaged the church entering house by house and dragging out both men and women and committing them to prison. They were thrown in cells. Not cell groups, cells. Right? Verse 4 says, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere doing what? Come on, doing what? Preaching the word of God. Their primary occupation was not that they were engineers or they were managers or they were business owners or they were accountants or they were teachers. They were preachers of the word. That was their occupation. One pastor I met 
in Kenya. He's a pastor. I could not go to one country to preach the gospel because in my passport, my occupation is written professional pastor. Yeah, that's true. And he could not go to that country. They refused him entry. He was supposed to be a chief speaker there. Preach the gospel. That country refused him without giving an explanation because that country is a little iron curtain country where you cannot just openly go and preach the gospel. Are you with me? He's a pastor. That's my lacuna in my passport. I said, change your passport, man. Make a simple passport, not a professional preacher. Hallelujah. So may I ask you a question today? Are you, your primary occupation is, can be called a preacher man? A preacher woman? Can you say that? If you can shout out, say hallelujah. Come on. If those who did not shout hallelujah, today you must get baptized, get filled with the Holy Spirit and take that primary occupation of preaching the gospel to the nations. That's what they did. 8,000 people. 8,000 minus 12. That many people were all scattered all around and they only did one thing. They, wherever they went, they were preaching the word. God actually used Satan's weapon of persecution as a means of moving his church into action. If you will not move, God will make you move. Good morning. Amen. You say, man, God is a traitor. God is a, you know, you know, tormentor, torturer. I don't want to follow this God. Yeah, it could be possible. You may not like his ways and means, but he allows certain things. Till you don't move, he will make you move. So let me encourage you church, if you are, have gone into inertia and you are unable to move forward, something is going to happen to you so that you'll start moving in Jesus name. Yeah. And the season has come and the time has come yeah. that there'll be no laziness, no lethargy, no procrastination when it comes to the preaching of the gospel in Jesus. Hallelujah. So be ready. I'm showing you from the scripture what happened. The church that was comfortable under the leadership of the apostles, God did what? Sent persecution. Why? They were so comfortable. They were growing. They were prospering. Everything was fantabulous. There was nothing wrong with that church. But one thing was wrong that they were not taking the initiative of preaching the gospel because God wanted not only the apostles but every member of the church to be a preacher man. That's right. Every member to be a minister. Every member to do the work of the ministry. Hallelujah. So God knew that when his people are finally ready to go, everybody would have a part to play in his divine plan. They would indeed be a special people, indeed be a kingdom of priests, and indeed a holy nation. Hallelujah. That's what God wants. Now imagine if you would train only two people in one year. Show me that chart. All right. Train two people in one year. If each one, teach one, at the end of year one, number of persons would be trained is two. In number second year, there'll be four. In number third year, there'll be eight. In number fourth year, there'll be 16. In number fifth year, there'll be 32. Persons trained, I'm not saying proselytes, trained, disciples who are ready to do the work of the ministry, who are ready to make other disciples. Right? And now we are in year 23. How many you would have saved? 8,388,608. In 23 years. But the thing is, you know, pastor is there, he's anointed. We love our pastor, you know. We, pastor Samuel is so good. You know, he's anointed, you know. We'll only go to him for prayer. We'll take this guy to give, be preached to him. That counseling also he'll do. Everything he'll do. What will we do? Nothing, we'll just sit under his leadership. This is what happened with the first church. They were happy with the apostles' leadership. They were fantabulous. Excellent leadership. 
but only the leaders remained <laughs> congregation was scattered but what they were doing preaching the word preaching the word your emirates airline is your tube where you fly everyone is there when you give them water and wine tell them let's have water and wine of the holy spirit When you're training people in your organization, give them the bread of life. Yeah, that's what you are called to do. That's what you are called to do. My dear brothers and sisters, in year 33, there'll be, I don't know how to pronounce this number. The last one. How would you pronounce, Brother Sammy? Eight billion, eh? Million. Billion. What is the population today? Eight billion. 8 billion people. See the formula? If you can each one, teach one, tell your neighbor, I will teach one. Come on, tell your neighbor, I will teach one. So what is happening? If you see the first year, to the new believers, two people to be trained. So I'm going to take a stock of inventory at the end of the year from you. I'm setting this goal to you and I'll ask you an answer where are those two trained people that you are giving in the house of God? Amen. What are you shaking your head? Okay, good morning. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Roger it. Amen. Are you rogering that? Yeah, no, Roger's here. But that's what I'm showing you. This. Only two people. In a year, forget about one month, two months. You know, today we do microwave Christians, fata fat. You know, put them in a microwave, you know, get them filled with the Holy Spirit, get whip them out and send them out, and then they fall. No, in one year, two people. Can we do that? I'm setting a goal before you today. Everybody, everybody, wherever they were scattered, they were preaching the word. They were not waiting for apostles, brother, pastor, you know, now I cannot come to church only, you know. They made their home, their church. They made their home, their church. Will your home be a church in this year? Amen. Good morning. Yes. Will your home be a church? Yes or no? Yes. Are you looking at me or looking at your phone? It's very important. Why? Your church must become a home. Church. Your home church. Why? Because the church is going to expand and grow. I'm prophesying to you in the name of the Lord. I'm prophesying to you. You receive it. Receive it in your spirit. Receive it in your mind. Receive it in your DNA. Because God is going to make it happen. Hallelujah. So the mandate is clear. What is the mandate? Mark chapter 16 verse 15. He said to them. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every creature. Have you preached the gospel to every creature? Mark 16 20 says, And then they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Can you see immediate action? Immediate obedience. Right? So what is happening in 15? Jesus is giving them the command. In verse 20, they are actioning the command. So I ask you to action the preaching and the teaching that you're receiving today with immediate effect. That means, as my sister Claudia was saying, okay, before the 31st of March, You'll have many new people in your life groups. Good morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. You must believe it. You must speak it. You must prophesy it. You must make it your baby. The preaching of the gospel is your baby, is your vision. Many people say, I don't have a vision. God is giving you a vision and a mission. Souls that has to be brought into the kingdom of God. So what should we do? Every believer should be ready to preach the gospel. Remember this job cannot be done during, can only be done during the harvest time. Because the winter is soon approaching and it will be too late. And we must preach the gospel today. Why? Because in eternity, the poor sinners, we fail to talk about Christ, will lament. 
right? They are going to lament how Jeremiah 20 says so. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. They are lamenting, and that lament is going to the eyes and the ears of God. He is listening to the lament of the sinners who are not saved in the harvest time. My dear brothers and sisters, no wonder Apostle Paul warns us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 34. Awake to righteousness and do not sin for some do not have the knowledge of God, he says. What is Paul saying? In essence, we can sin by failing to obey the great commission. When we fail to pray, we sin. When we fail to preach the gospel, we sin. And you say, Pastor, you know, you're casting too much of burden on us. We're already burdened. We've got sales targets in our office place. We've got business targets to meet in our business achievement. You're giving soul target also. That's your primary target. Hallelujah. If you would achieve your primary target, I promise you, God will give you every other target to be achieved in the secular realm. I promise you that. You try it. Come on, you try it. I promise you, come and tell me that pastor your preaching was wrong. It was unsubstantial. I have lost everything because I'm serving Christ. You may lose, but you'll gain. Why? Because you're gaining for all eternity. But I promise you, God will grant you success. You do what God is telling you to do. You action what God is telling you to action. And I promise you, God will action everything else to come to you. Your job will come, your business will come, your baby will come, your spouse will come, everyone will come. Children will come, everything will come to you. Customers will come, clients will come, deals will be signed, but you do what the Lord is calling you to do. That's your first commission. And that's what God is calling you. So Paul is saying we can sin by failing to obey the great commission. And I would encourage you to take Jesus' words to your heart. In the book of John chapter 4 verse 35. Do you not say that there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Listen, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields that they are ready, already white for harvest. Already white. A wheat harvest is always taken when it's shining golden. That's the time to reap. But now it's past the harvest time. They become white. Too long. It has remained in the field. My dear brothers and sisters, God is calling you that. In Matthew chapter 24, 14, Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. If you want Jesus to come soon, then partner in his plan of reconciliation and make his plan your mission. Hallelujah. And Revelation 22, 20 says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. Then and only then we can say, Lord come. Now only you're saying, Lord, come. You're not preaching the gospel. Come, Lord. Oh, I've got so many burdens and problems, Lord. Come, take me, Lord. Take me. I've got some disease. Take me, Lord. Are you to take you? You have to live for 120 years. Do the work of the ministry. Without doing any work, you want to go free of charge. Free salvation, free food, free water, free everything. And do, don't give any return into the house of God. You just want to go. How will you give an accounting statement there? Are Baba, you have taken everything, given nothing. Right? So let there be a trial balance done on your life and an accounting done on your life and say, God, here am I. Give me souls, O Lord. Come on. Forget our give me water, give me business, give me Lord, this. give me souls. If you're focused on asking for souls, I promise you, everything else will come to you. Everything else. I was writing then when I was reading that I'm studying Genesis line by line, word by word. <laughs> so God met with Jacob and he changed his name at Penal from Jacob to Israel. And the moment when God left him and went, he built an altar. 
So something beautiful that I wrote in locations featuring a tent an altar for God should be present and in areas with a house there should be a church within it. Hallelujah. Everywhere your patriarchs built an altar, built an altar, built an altar. Altars were a milestones of reminders in the journey of faith so that they knew that they met with God they knew that they encountered God. They have received the blessing and they consecrated that place. My dear brothers and sisters, in your tents, let there be altars and in your houses, let there be churches. Hallelujah. Let that be a place of consecration, of holiness, of an environment that God will come and dwell in that place. So that anyone who comes to your house, They'll say there's something different in this house. There is peace in this house. There is joy in this house. There is healing in this house. There is some kind of tranquility in this house. Let that house be a house of prayer. And let that house of yours be a house where a church is found within it. Will you make that your personal agenda for this year? Will you make that your personal goal for this year and say, God, my life will be a soul winning life and my house will be a church for you. Hallelujah. Let's all rise in the presence of God. Come on. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Where we have a tent, God must have an altar. Where we have a house, he must have a church in it. Where we have a tent, God must have an altar where we have a house. We must have, he must have a church in it. Let your houses be churches. Let your tents be altars for God. Come on, let's pray. Let's everybody, everywhere. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, everywhere. This word is for you. This word is for me. Hallelujah. This word is not that I preach to you, but this goal God has given to me. I'm sharing that goal with you. A bigger goal with you. Hallelujah. And we saw that table. Eight billion people plus has been saved when everyone, every believer is actioning the work of the gospel, preaching the word to every nation. They were scattered and wherever they went, they preached the word. Wherever they went, they preached the word. My dear brothers and sisters, let there be preaching of the word wherever you go in this country or wherever in the world, wherever you travel, wherever you do business. I promise you the Lord is calling you for a greater, greater vision, for a greater outpouring of the spirit, for a greater inundation of his glory so that you will never be the same. You will be changed. You'll be glory houses. You'll be power houses. You'll be healing houses. You'll be prophecy houses. You will be men and women who will declare and decree the goodness of God and the power of God and you will know that it is God who has spoken and it is God who is bringing it to pass. It is God who is doing mighty miracles through you that in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus you'll start raising up the dead, laying your hands on the sick and they will be healed and delivered that you will prophesy that in the name of Jesus you'll cause the lame to walk the blind to see the deaf to hear the dumb to speak hallelujah there'll be creative miracles that will happen through your life in your homes in Jesus name because your homes will be holy homes your homes will be churches that you have created for God where people will come and they will find a sanctuary in your house of dwelling Come on, everybody. Lord we thank you we bless you Father God we worship you Lord we make a covenant with you today come on church pray hallelujah hallelujah open your mouth and say Lord yes Lord in this year two souls I will train two souls I will train uh, two only two I'm asking only two in one year come on if you can do more than that praise the Lord hallelujah but I'm giving a very minuscule target and that minuscule is only two souls that you will train in a year. Only two. 
That's what the Lord is calling you. It's the call of the Holy Spirit. It's the call of the Holy Spirit, my dear brothers and sisters. Because Jesus is coming soon. And before his coming, there'll be a great, great harvest from all over the world. That's what the world word of God says. There will be a huge harvest before the ultimate coming of Jesus. Hallelujah. Huge harvest. Be prepared. Be prepared. Prepare my church, saith the Lord. Prepare my sons and the daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Be prepared because I'm coming soon. Give us the grace as a church, O Lord. Forgive us of our inertia. Forgive us, O Lord God Almighty, that we have not taken heed oh father when we read in the book of mark lord you gave them the instruction in verse 20 they went everywhere preaching the gospel immediately lord after being born again we have stayed idle we are only drawing waters of salvation we have become such consumerist attitude oh father the lord we are only consuming on the grace of yeshua but never contributing to the expansion of your kingdom forgive us for that oh god Forgive us, O God, Lord, with our time, with our talent, with our energy, with our money, with our strength, with our valor, with our power, with our honor, we will serve you, O God. Lord, Father, Joshua reminds us that, Lord, in the end time, in his old age, Joshua said that when the people started to go away from the Lord God Almighty, Joshua said, I do not know about you, but for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He was confident of one thing was about his own house. He was confident of one thing that his, he and his household will be serving the Lord. Shabalamanda, will you be that house that can boldly align your thinking and your saying and your speech like Joshua said. It doesn't matter what's happening with the world outside. It doesn't matter what's happening around me. But for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Shabalamanda. Come on, if you can dare to speak that and make a covenant to that, to the Lord, say to the Lord, not to me, say to the Lord. Hallelujah. It's not for your pastor, it is for the pastor of your pastor, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the great and the good shepherd, who wants uh, an answer, who wants uh, a goal setting. He's a shrewd businessman. He has invested the blood of his son, the priceless blood of Yeshua, upon your life, and he wants a return on that. He wants a return on that. And the return is the souls that you can bring into the house of God. That is the biggest thing and the greatest thing that you can ever do. Souls into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Shebana mandara kanamase. Father, you have heard us speak. And you have heard us make a vow. You have heard us, O oh God, that we want to be missionaries. You have heard us, the Lord send us. You have heard us, O oh God, the Lord, you have commanded us to go and we are willing, we are ready. Send me, O oh Lord. Who will go for us? Whom can I send? Send me, O oh God. Send me, O oh God. Don't send my wife and my children. Send me. Send me, O oh Lord. Come on. Send me, O oh God. It's between you and your God. Send us. As Amazing Grace Church, send us. This church will be a missionary sending church globally. I prophesy to you. Already God has sent and placed people all over the world in these last 23 years. He'll be sending more. Are you ready to go? Come on, are you ready to go? Shabala Mandara. And you'll be fruitful wherever you go. Whichever country you go. Wherever you immigrate. Sabalama, you will preach the word because you are so well trained, you are so well honed and you have, you have honed your skills so well that God is saying, hey, what are you doing with your skill sets? What are you doing with your anointing? Are you planting any churches? Are you going on a mission? Are you doing the salvation work? That's what the Lord is asking. Father, I thank you, Lord. Give us the grace. Give us the grace. Give us, oh God, multiplied levels, oh Father. Oh Lord, faith without works is dead. 
And therefore I pray, O Lord God Almighty, that once we have asked for souls, we will look for souls. We will go after them. We'll pray for the five people whom we know in our vicinity in the market. Not the Christians who are already saved, the ones who are not saved. Lord, give them to us that we will pray and we will say, Lord, give them to us in the name of Jesus. Give those families to us in the name of Jesus. Our cousins, our uncles, our aunties who are perishing in this world outside, they must not. But they must be saved, O oh Father. They must come into the house of God. They must be trained and they must be discipled in the name of Jesus. And I will do that work. Anoint us, God. Empower us. Let there be open heavens upon us as a church. That will truly be the salt, the light and a voice unto the nations. These are your people bought by your blood. Filled by you with your Holy Spirit, I pray. Perfect everything that concerned them. As Abraham was rich in faith, in cattle, in gold and in silver. So shall your church will be. They will lack no good thing. Because they have made the preaching of the word their primary occupation. And we thank you. We love you. We bless you. And we give you the praise, glory, honor, dominion, power and authority. Because it all belongs to you and to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of His sweet Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. And all the saints of God said, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a big clap offering. Hallelujah. God is to be praised. We love you. God bless you.